Hey everybody, it's Mr. N here, and we've got uh, this next lesson. Um, this is on inductive and deductive reasoning. First of all, let's talk about what um, deductive reasoning is. Deductive reasoning is something that you've always been doing, something that you are accustomed to. Um, you take a look at the facts, you take a look at what's going on, and then you make a conclusion. And that conclusion that you make is based on facts. It's based on evidence. It's based on solid things that you know. Um, and in math, it could be theorems, it could be postulates, it could be those type. it could be rules. And those are uh, the things you use to make your deductive reasoning. So we could say here deductive reasoning is based on facts. Rules, definitions, postulates, theorems. Then we have inductive reasoning. You also use inductive reasoning a lot, whether you, again, know it or not. And this is like you, you're taking a look at something and you find some sort of pattern. And you say, okay, look, this is happening whenever this other thing happens. And this pattern is true all the time. And because of that, you can conclude it. So that is inductive reasoning. So let's take a look at this pattern as our example. And that's our biggest thing that we can, uh, easiest way to explain to you guys for inductive reasoning is it's based on patterns. So uh, right here, if we take a look at this, one, two, three, five, and eight. All right, well, what comes next? Well, let me see what I'm doing here. Let's see. I went from one to two, then from two to three. Oh, wait. If I take these two numbers, add them up, I'll get the next value. Then two plus three, I'll get the five. Then 3 plus 5, I'll get the 8. So then 8 plus 5, so I need to determine what would come next. That would be 13. So then 13 plus 8, that would be the 21. 21 plus 13 would give me the 34, and so on. So that's inductive reasoning with a pattern. Obviously, there's other ways, but that's the biggest one that um, you guys can uh, comprehend. But whenever we uh, come up with something, whether we use inductive or deductive reasoning, whenever we come up with our conclusion, if at any time you can find a counterexample, okay, and what I mean by a counterexample is that it refutes or disproves your hypotheses, your theorem, your proposition. So whatever you're saying, if you can find one counterexample, then your whole statement right there will be false okay so if I'll sometimes I'll say find a counterexample that makes this false and you'll have to give me a reason a situation or a solution and you'll see what I'm talking about more when we do the example problems all right now this pattern that I showed you up above is really this and it's pretty interesting and this pattern we find it in nature a lot one of them is this um, Nautilus and how it grows in the chambers and here is this pattern as it grows this is what you'll see as far as um, the size of it and um, so we can uh, approximate the Nautilus spiral formed in this way and this pattern we see it in nature a lot is called the Fibonacci sequence now Fibonacci is a very very famous uh, mathematician and he found this sequence by chance. He was um, examining, uh, the story goes, this is a story, uh, that he was examining how rabbits multiply, and he noticed this pattern, and this is what he developed. And so um, the crazy part is, is that we see it a lot in nature. Um, a lot of things end up, uh, as we observe them, follow this Fibonacci sequence, which is kind of cool. Um, but he was the one that first discovered it, named after him, and we see this pattern in a lot of different places. For example, um, you see it sometimes in optics, you see it in probability. Um, in fact, it's kind of crazy that uh, some uh, stock market analysts, when they follow patterns of stocks, they'll start using a Fibonacci sequence to see if it uh, models that so they can make predictions based on that. But in any case... There have been uh, many people that have referred to it as nature's code as well. 
So let's take a look at what we have next on the second page here, um, and we can uh, take a look at uh, deductive reasoning as I explained it to you guys. And um, as we see here, I mean, enlarge this, it's based on facts, definitions, accepted properties. Um, it's different from uh, inductive, where uh, you're basing it on patterns. Then we've got laws of logic. And there's two that we're going to talk about right now. Um, the first one is called the law of detachment. And basically, if the hypothesis of a conditional statement is true, remember, a conditional statement, we have if P, then Q. So if the hypothesis of a true conditional statement is true, so what I'm saying is this whole conditional statement is true. And if this hypothesis part is true, right here, then the conclusion, which is that, our conclusion, must also be true. So if the whole statement right here is true, and this is true, that must be true as well, so the conclusion. So that's what the law of detachment is. We can detach the conclusion from the whole statement and say that it's true as well. Then there's the law of syllogism. I've also heard people pronounce it syllogism, um, but regardless, here's what it says. If the hypothesis P, then conclusion Q. If the hypothesis Q, then conclusion R. If the hypothesis P, then conclusion R. So wait, if these statements are true, then this last statement is true. And here's how I want you to think of it. You learn this in uh, algebra 1 as the transitive property. So what you said was if P then Q, if Q then R, and that results in, look, if this goes here and this goes here, then that means P can go straight to R as your conclusion there. So that's what this is saying, and it's like the transitive property. So Here's what we have. We've got deductive reasoning. We did inductive reasoning. We've got the law of detachment. And then we've got the law of syllogism, which we said was very similar to the transitive property. Here it is, um, detachment. If P then Q is true and P is true, then this conclusion is true also. Over here, we say if P to Q and Q to R, then we can follow by saying P to R right there um, would be true and that's again just the transitive property. So now let's move on to our last page here and see um, we've got a f we've got some examples that we can take a look at and let me enlarge this and it says determine whether the stated conclusion is valid based on the given information. If not, write invalid and explain your reasoning. So for this first one if the sum of the measures of two angles is 180, then the angles are supplementary. The measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle B is 180. The conclusion A and B are supplementary. So that's what we concluded on this. And we need to determine if this conclusion is valid. And yes, it's a valid conclusion. Um, if the measure is 180, then the angles are supplementary. Well, these two are supplementary because that's our conclusion based on that statement right there. Next, given the sum of the measures of two angles is 90, then the angles are complementary. The measure of angle ABC is 45, the measure of angle DEF is 48. Our conclusion, angles ABC and DEF are complementary. No, this is invalid because 45 and 48 do not add up to be 90, so they are not complementary. Looking at the next one. If the sum of the measure of two angles is 180, then the angles are supplementary. 1 and 2 are linear pair. 1 and 2 are supplementary. That is valid, because what do we know about a linear pair? Linear pair adds up to be 180. So the angles are 180, then they're supplementary. Since they are linear pair, we know it's going to be 180, so we know that they are supplementary. 
All right, moving on to a couple of these. Now, a couple of these are going to get kind of a little funky, so let's take a look. Use the law of syllogism to draw a valid conclusion for each set of statements, if possible. If no valid conclusion can be drawn, write no valid conclusion and explain your reasoning. If two angles are complementary, then the sum of their measures is 90. If the sum of uh, the measures of two angles is 90, then both angles are acute. So, can you conclude from the law of syllogism, this is P, this is Q, this is Q, this is R. So then you can, let's see, uh, to try to draw a valid conclusion, if two angles are complementary, then both of the angles are acute. So there is how I use the law of syllogism. And is this a valid conclusion? Yes, it's a valid conclusion. Looking at the next one. If the heat wave continues, then the air conditioning will be used more frequently. If the air conditioning is used more frequently, then energy costs will be higher. Now, we need to determine if this is a valid conclusion. So, here's our P, there's our Q, this is Q, this is R. So, if the heat wave continues, then energy costs will be higher. Let's go back and look at this first one. If two angles are complementary, that means they add up to be 90, then both the angles are acute. Okay, so this has to be true. I want to explain to you guys that this has to be true because if one of them is obtuse or a right angle, then you're going to end up with more than 90 and you can't have them complementary. So you can come up with a counterexample, something to disprove um, this, but you can't, like, they have to be acute. They must be. There's no other way. So, because you need them to add up to be 90. Now, but take a look at this one. If the heat wave continues, then the energy cost will be higher. Well, uh, you can't quite conclude this. We're going to say no valid conclusion. And let me explain to you why I'm going to say no valid conclusion for this. No valid conclusion. Well, what if we use solar? What if we're using solar a lot and the heat wave is on? and we've got everybody running their solar, that doesn't mean energy costs will be higher. So this day and age, we cannot conclude that because we live in an age where there's a lot of solar going on. So even if you use the air conditioner a lot, it may not matter. So that is a situation where you can't just quite conclude this and for sure because there are too many other hypotheticals. Look at the next one. On this next one, if it is Tuesday, then more then Marla tutors chemistry. If Marla tutors chemistry, then she arrives home at 4 p.m. So if it is Tuesday, then Marla, then she arrives home at 4 p.m. Well, what if she didn't tutor that day? What if, I mean, that's not a definite it must happen. This is not a definite it must happen. So it's not necessarily completely true. So she could arrive home at 4.15. What if she tutored longer? What if the person needed a little bit extra help? So this, you cannot, you cannot make this valid conclusion. So no valid conclusion. And again, I want to explain why. Look, go back to this first one. There is nothing else that the angles can be. They must be acute. There is no other possibility. Here there's other possibilities. Here there's other possibilities. So look at number seven now. If a marine animal is a starfish, then it lives in the intertidal zone of the ocean. The intertidal zone is the least stable of the oceans. So you could say this. You could say, if a marine animal is a starfish, uh, then it lives in the intertidal zone. So it, then it lives in the least stable of ocean zones. So if a marine animal is a starfish, then it lives in the least stable of ocean zones. And in this case, I'm going to say... No valid conclusion again. Well, 
what if it's a starfish and it's at SeaWorld? What if it's a starfish and at some, uh, uh, the Long Beach Aquarium or any aquarium for that matter, right? So it doesn't have to necessarily be there. And that's why um, some of these can kind of get a little funky, like I said. Just examine it when it's asking you these types of questions and ask yourself, is this the only way that it can happen? If this is the only way that it can happen, then it's a valid conclusion. All right, taking a look at what we have next. Um, we are going to do a couple of these examples right here and write a conjecture that describes the pattern or the sequence. So what you can um, do on this one is, let's take a look, we've got, we're just adding another part of it. So the next one would be uh, this, like this, right? And then we go up like this, and this would be like that. So we'll do this, these X's here, Okay, then the next one would go like this. My drawing is not as good. And then the next one we have this part of it going like that again. And then we are shading here and here, here and here, here and shade there. Then the next one we shade in those spots. And this is inductive reasoning that I use to come up with this pattern. So you could say right here, another way you could say is we've got one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Now we have one, two, three, four, five that are not shaded like that. Over here, um, what is the pattern that's going on? In this pattern, I'm adding three, adding three, adding three. So adding three is the pattern. And then determine uh, the next item in the sequence. Add 3, you would get 11. Over here, take a look at what I'm doing. I'm going 6, 5, 4, and then I have a number here, and then this would be 3, right? And then 11 halves, 9 halves, 7 halves. That would be the pattern to this. And you can say it in words. This would be, right, 11 over 2 would be 5.5. Then 5. Then this is 4.5. 4. So you could say subtract a half. All right, taking a look at this last one. Over here, I'm going negative 2 to 4. Then, oh, looks like I'm multiplying by negative 2 each time. So multiply by negative 2. So this would be 64. That would be next. All right, we are going to do the student journal ones in class. We will finish up on those. So thanks for watching. Hit that like and subscribe button, and I'll see you guys in the next video.